The Bishop by Anton Chekhov. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The evening service was being celebrated on the eve of Palm Sunday in the old Petrushevsky convent. When they began distributing the palm, it was close upon ten o'clock. The candles were burning dimly, the wicks wanted snuffing. It was all in a sort of mist. In the twilight of the church the crowd seemed heaving like the sea, and to Bishop Pyotr, who had been unwell for the last three days, it seemed that all the faces, old and young, men's and women's, were alike, and that everyone who came up to the palm had the same expression in his eyes. In the mist he could not see the doors. The crowd kept moving and looked as though there were no end to it. The female choir was singing. A nun was reading the prayer for the day. How stifling! How hot it was! How long the service went on! Bishop Pyotr was tired. His breath was labored and rapid, his throat was parched, his shoulders ached with weariness, his legs were trembling. And it disturbed him unpleasantly when a religious maniac uttered occasional shrieks in the gallery. And then all of a sudden, as though in a dream or a delirium, it seemed to the bishop as though his own mother, Marcia Timofeyevna, whom he had not seen for nine years, or some old woman just like his mother, came to him out of the crowd, and after taking a palm branch from him, walked away looking at him all the while good-humouredly with a kind, joyful smile until she was lost in the crowd. And for some reason tears flowed down his face. There was peace in his heart. Everything was well. Yet he kept gazing fixedly toward the left choir, where the prayers were being read, where in the dusk of evening you could not recognize anyone, and wept. Tears glistened on his face and on his beard. Here someone close at hand was weeping, and then someone else far away, then others and still others, and little by little the church was filled with soft weeping. And a little later, within five minutes, the nun's choir was singing. No one was weeping, and everything was as before. Soon the service was over. When the bishop got into his carriage to drive home, the gay, melodious chime of the heavy, costly bells was filling the whole garden in the moonlight. The white walls, the white crosses on the tombs, the white birch trees, and the black shadows, and the faraway moon in the sky exactly over the convent, seemed now living their own life apart and incomprehensible, yet very near to man. It was the beginning of April, and after the warm spring day it turned cool. There was a faint touch of frost, and the breath of spring could be felt in the soft, chilly air. The road from the convent to the town was sandy, the horses had to go at a walking pace, and on both sides of the carriage, in the brilliant, peaceful moonlight, there were people trudging along home from the church through the sand. And all was silent, sunk in thought, everything seemed kindly, youthful, akin, everything, tree and skies and even the moon, and one longed to think that so it would be always. At last the carriage drove into the town and rumbled along the principal street. The shops were already shut, but at Arakin's, the millionaire shopkeepers, they were trying the new electric lights, which flickered brightly, and a crowd of people were gathered round. Then came dark deserted streets, one after another, then the high road, the open country, the fragrance of pines and suddenly there rose up before the bishop's eyes a white turreted wall, and behind that a tall belfry in the full moonlight, and beside it five shining golden cupolas. This was the Pankratevsky Monastery in which Bishop Pyotr lived. And here, too, high above the monastery, was the silent, dreamy moon. The carriage drove in at the gate, crunching over the sand. Here and there in the moonlight there were glimpses of dark monastic figures, and there was a sound of footsteps in the flagstones. "'You know, Your Holiness, your mamma arrived while you were away,' the lay brother informed the bishop as he walked into his cell. "'My mother? When did she come?' "'Before the evening services. She asked first where you were, and then she went to the convent. "'Then it was her I saw in the church just now. Oh, Lord!' And the bishop laughed with joy. "'She bade me tell Your Holiness,' the lay brother went on, "'that she would come tomorrow. She had a little girl with her, her grandchild, I suppose. They are staying at Osyanikov's inn.' What time is it now? A little after eleven. Oh, how vexing! The bishop sat a little while in the parlor, hesitating and as it were refusing to believe that it was so late. His arms and legs were stiff, his head ached, he was hot and uncomfortable. After resting a little he went into his bedroom, and there too he sat a little, still thinking about his mother. He could hear the lay brother going away, and Father Sisoy coughing on the other side of the wall. The monastery clock struck a quarter. The bishop changed his clothes and began reading the prayers before sleep. He read attentively those old, long-familiar prayers, and at the same time thought about his mother. 
She had nine children and about forty grandchildren. At one time she had lived with her husband, the deacon, in a poor village. She had lived there a very long time, from the age of seventeen to sixty. The bishop remembered her from early childhood, almost from the age of three, and how he had loved her. Sweet, precious childhood, always fondly remembered. Why did it, that long past time, that could never return, why did it seem brighter, fuller, and more festive than it really had been? When in his childhood or youth he had been ill, how tender and sympathetic his mother had been! And now his prayers mingled with the memories, which gleamed more and more brightly like a flame, and the prayers did not hinder his thinking of his mother. When he had finished his prayers, he undressed and laid down, and at once, as soon as it was dark, there rose before his mind his dead father, his mother, his native village, Le Sompoli, the creak of wheels, the bleat of sheep, the church bells on bright summer mornings, the gypsies under the window. Oh, how sweet to think of it! He remembered the priest of Lesopoli, Father Simeon, mild, gentle, kindly. He was a lean little man, while his son, a divinity student, was a huge fellow and talked in a roaring bass voice. The priest's son had flown into a rage with the cook and abused her. Ah, you Jehud's ass! And Father Simeon, overhearing it, said not a word, and was only ashamed because he could not remember where such an ass was mentioned in the Bible. After him, the priest at Lesopoli had been Father Dimyan, who used to drink heavily, and at times drank until he saw green snakes, and was even nicknamed Dimyan Snakeseer. The schoolmaster at Lesopoli was Matvey Nikolaevich, who had been a divinity student, a kind and intelligent man, but he too was a drunkard. He never beat the school children, but for some reason he always had hanging on his wall a bunch of birch twigs, and below it an utterly meaningless inscription in Latin. Betula Kinter Balsamica Secuta. He had a shaggy black dog whom he called Syntax. And His Holiness laughed. Six miles from Lesopoli was the village of Nino, with a wonder-working icon. In the summer they used to carry the icon in procession about the neighborhood villages, and ring the bells the whole day long, first in one village, then in another, and it used to seem to the bishop that joy was quivering in the air, and that he, in those days his name was Pavlusha, used to follow the icon, bareheaded and barefooted, with naive faith and with a naive smile, infinitely happy. In Omnino, he remembered now, there were always a lot of people, and the priest there, Father Alexei, to save time during Mass, used to make his deaf nephew, Alarion, read the name of those for whose health or for whose souls is peace prayers were asked. Alarion used to read them, now and then getting a five or ten kopeck piece for the service, and only when he was gray and bald, when life was nearly over, he suddenly saw written on one of the pieces of paper, What a fool you are, Alarion. Up to fifteen at least, Pavlusha was undeveloped and idle at his lessons, so much so that they thought of taking him away from the clerical school and putting him into a shop. One day, going to the post at Obina for letters, he had stared a long time at the post office clerks and asked, Allow me to ask, how do you get your salary, every month or every day? His holiness crossed himself and turned over to the other side, trying to stop thinking and go to sleep. My mother has come, he remembered, and laughed. The moon peeped in at the window, the floor was lighted up, and there were shadows on it. A cricket was chirping. Through the wall Father Sisoy was snoring in the next room, and his aged snore had, had a sound that suggested loneliness, forlornness, and even vagrancy. Sisoy had once been the housekeeper to the bishop of the diocese, and was now called the former father housekeeper. He was seventy years old. He lived in the monastery twelve miles from the town and stayed sometimes in the town too. He had come from the Pankrachevsky monastery three days before, and the bishop had kept him that he might talk to him at his leisure about matters of business, about the arrangements here. At half past one they began ringing for matins. Father Sisoy could be heard coughing, muttering something in a discontented voice. Then he got up and walked barefoot about the rooms. Father Sisoy, the bishop called. Sisoy went back to his room and a little later made his appearance in his boots with a candle. He had on his cassock over his underclothes, and on his head was an old faded skull cap. I can't sleep, said the bishop, sitting up. I must be unwell. And what it is, I don't know. Fever. You must have caught a cold, your holiness. You must be rubbed with tallow. Sisoy stood a little and yawned. Oh, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. They had the electric lights on at Erikin's today, he said. I don't like it. Father Sisoy was old, lean, bent, always dissatisfied with something and his eyes were angry-looking and prominent as a crab's. "'I don't like it,' he said, going away. "'I don't like it. Bother it!' Next day, Palm Sunday, the bishop took the service in the cathedral in town, and then he visited the bishop of the diocese, then visited a very sick old lady, 
the widow of a general, and at last drove home. Between one and two o'clock he had welcomed visitors dining with him, his mother and his niece Katya, a child of eight years old. At dinner time the spring sunshine was streaming in at, at the windows, throwing bright lights over the white tablecloth and on Katya's red hair. Through the double windows they could hear the noise of the rooks and the notes of the starlings in the garden. "'It is nine years since we have met,' said the old lady. "'And when I looked at you in the monastery yesterday, good Lord, you've not changed a bit, except maybe you are thinner and your beard is a little longer. Holy Mother, Queen of Heaven, yesterday at the evening service no one could help crying. I, too, as I looked at you, suddenly began crying, though I couldn't say why. His holy will!' And in spite of the affectionate tone in which he had said this, he could see that she was constrained as though she was uncertain whether to address him formally or familiarly, to laugh or not, and then she felt herself more a deacon's widow than his mother. And Katya gazed without blinking at her uncle, his holiness, as though trying to discover what sort of person he was. Her hair sprang up from under the comb and the velvet ribbon, and stood out like a halo. She had a turned-up nose and sly eyes. The child had broken a glass before sitting down to dinner, and now her grandmother, as she talked, moved away from Katya, first a wine glass and then a tumbler. The bishop listened to his mother and remembered how many, many years ago she used to take him and his brothers and sisters to relations whom she considered rich. In those days she was taken up with the case of her children, now with her grandchildren, and she had brought Katya. Your sister Varenka has four children, she told him. Katya here is the eldest, and your brother-in-law, Father Ivan, felt sick. God knows of what, and died three days before the Assumption, and my poor Varenka is left a beggar. And how is Nicanor getting on? the bishop asked about his eldest brother. He is all right, thank God. Though he has nothing much, yet he can live. Only there is one thing. His son, my grandson Nikolashka, did not want to go to church. He has gone to university to be a doctor. He thinks that is better, but who knows? His holy will. Nikolashka cuts up dead people said Katya, spilling water over her knees. "'Sit still, child,' her mother observed calmly and took the glass out of her hand. "'Say a prayer and go on eating.' "'How long it is since we've seen each other,' said the bishop, and he tenderly stroked his mother's hand and shoulder. "'And I missed you abroad, mother. I missed you dreadfully.' "'Thank you. I used to sit in the evenings at the open window, lonely and alone. Often there was music playing, and all at once I used to become overcome with homesickness and felt as though I would give everything only to be home and see you.' His mother smiled, beamed, but at once she made a grave face and said, Thank you. His mood suddenly changed. He looked at his mother and could not understand how she could come by that respectfulness, that timid expression of face. What was it for? And he did not recognize her. He felt sad and vexed, and then his head ached just as it had the day before. His legs felt fearfully tired. The fish seemed to him stale and tasteless. He felt thirsty all the time. After dinner, two rich ladies, landowners, arrived and sat for an hour and a half in silence with rigid countenances. The Archimandrite, a silent, rather deaf man, came to see him about business. Then they began ringing for vespers. The sun was setting behind the wood, and the day was over. When he returned from church, he hurriedly said his prayers, got into bed, and wrapped himself up as warmly as possible. It was disagreeable to remember the fish he had eaten at dinner. The moonlight worried him, and then he heard talking. In the adjourning room, probably in the parlor, Father Sasoy was talking politics. There's a war among the Japanese now. They're fighting. The Japanese, my good soul, are the same as the Montenegrins. They are the same race. They were under the Turkish yoke together. And then he heard the voice of Marcia Timofievna. So having said our prayers and drunk tea, we went, you know, to Father Yeager at so. And she kept on saying, having had tea, or having drunk tea, and it seemed as though the only thing she had done in her life was to drink tea. The bishop slowly, languidly recalled the seminary, the academy. For three years he had been Greek teacher in the seminary. By that time he could not read without spectacles. Then he had become a monk. He had been made a school inspector. Then he had defended his thesis for his degree. When he was thirty-two he had made rector of the seminary, and consecrated Archimandrite. And then his life had been so easy, so pleasant. It seemed so long, so long. No end was in sight. Then he had begun to be ill had grown very thin and almost blind, and by advice of the doctors had to give up everything and go abroad. "'And what then?' asked Sasoy in the next room. "'Then we drank tea,' answered Marcia Timofievna. "'Good gracious, you've got a green beard,' said Katya suddenly in surprise, and she laughed. The bishop remembered that the grey-haired Father Sasoy's beard really had a shade of green in it, and he laughed. 
God have mercy upon us, what we have to put up with with this girl, said Cecilia aloud, getting angry. Spoiled child, sit quiet. The bishop remembered the perfectly new white church in which he had conducted the services while living abroad. He remembered the sound of the warm sea. In his flat he had five lofty light rooms. In his study he had a new writing table, lots of books. He had read a great deal and often written, and he had remembered how he pined for his native land, how a blind beggar woman had played the guitar under his window every day and had sung of love, and how, as he listened, he had always for some reason thought of the past. But eight years had passed and he had been called back to Russia, and now he was a suffragan bishop, and all the past had retreated far away into the mist as though it were a dream. Father Sisoy came into the bedroom with a candle. I say, he said, wondering, are you asleep already, your holiness? What is it? Why, it's still early, ten o'clock or less. I bought a candle today. I wanted to rub you with tallow. I am in a fever, said the bishop, and he sat up. I really ought to have something. My head is bad. Sisoy took off the bishop's shirt and began rubbing his chest and back with tallow. That's the way, that's the way, he said. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. I walked to the town today. I was at what's-his-name's, the chief priest Sidonsky's. I had tea with him. I don't like him. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. I don't like him. The bishop of the diocese, a very fat old man, was ill with rheumatism or gout, and had been in bed for over a month. Bishop Pyotr went to see him almost every day, and saw all who came to ask his help. And now that he was unwell, he was struck by the emptiness, the triviality of everything which they asked and for which they wept. He was vexed at their ignorance, their timidity, and all this useless petty business oppressed him by the mass of it, and it seemed to him that now he understood the diocesan bishop, who had once in his young days written on the doctrines of the freedom of the will, and now seemed to be all lost in trivialities, to have forgotten everything, and to have no thoughts of religion. The bishop must have lost touch with Russian life while he was abroad. He did not find it easy. The peasants seemed to him coarse, the women who sought his help dull and stupid, the seminarists and their teachers uncultivated and at times savage. And the documents coming in and going out were reckoned by tens of thousands, and what documents they were. The higher clergy in the whole diocese gave the priests, young and old, and even their wives and children, marks for the behavior, a five, a four, and sometimes even a three. And about this he had to talk and to read and to write serious reports. And there was positively not one minute to spare. His soul was troubled all day long, and the bishop was only at peace when he was at church. He could not get used, either, to the awe which, through no wish of his own, he inspired in people in spite of his quiet, modest disposition. All the people in the province seemed to him little, scared, and guilty when he looked at them. Everyone was timid in his presence, even the old chief priests. Everyone flopped at his feet. And not long previously, an old lady, a village priest's wife, who had come to consult him, was so overcome by awe that she could not utter a single word, and went empty away. And he, who could never in his sermons bring himself to speak ill of people, never reproached any one because he was sorry for them, was moved to fury by the people who came to consult him, lost his temper, and flung their petitions on the floor. The whole time he had been here, not one person had spoken to him genuinely, simply, as to a human being. Even his old mother seemed now not the same. And why, he wondered, did she chatter away to Sisoy and laugh so much, while with him, her son, she was grave and usually silent and constrained, which did not suit her at all. The only person who behaved freely with him and said what he meant was old Sisoy, who had spent his whole life in the presence of bishops and had outlived eleven of them. And so the bishop was at ease with him, although, of course, he was a tedious and nonsensical man. After the service on Tuesday, His Holiness Pyotr was in the diocesan bishop's house receiving petitions there. He got excited and angry and then drove home. He was as unwell as before. He longed to be in bed, but he had hardly reached home when he was informed that a young merchant called Erikin, who had subscribed liberally to charities, had come to see him about a very important matter. The bishop had to see him. Arakin stayed about an hour, talked very loud, almost shouted, and it was difficult to understand what he said. "'God grant it may,' he said as he went out. "'Most essential. According to circumstances, Your Holiness, I trust it may.' After him came the mother superior from a distant convent, and when she had gone they began ringing for vespers. He had to go to church. In the evening the monks sang harmoniously with inspiration. A young priest with a black beard conducted the service, and the bishop, hearing of the bridegroom who comes at midnight and of the heavenly mansion adorned for the festival, felt no repentance for his sins, no tribulation, but peace at heart and tranquility. And he was carried back in thought to the distant past, to his childhood and youth, 
when, too, they used to sing of the bridegroom of the heavenly mansion. And now that past rose up before him, living fair and joyful as in all likelihood it had never been. And perhaps in the other world, in the life to come, we shall think of the distant past, of our life here, with the same feeling. Who knows? The bishop was sitting near the altar. It was dark. Tears flowed down his face. He thought that here he had attained everything a man in his position could attain. He had faith, and yet everything was not clear. Something was lacking still. He did not want to die, and he felt that he had missed what was most important, something of which he had dimly dreamed in the past. And he was troubled by the same hopes for the future as he had felt in childhood at the academy and abroad. How well they sing today, he thought, listening to the singing. How nice it is. On Thursday he celebrated Mass in the cathedral. It was the washing of feet. When the service was over and the people were going home, it was sunny, warm. The water gurgled in the gutters, and the unceasing trilling of the larks, tender, telling of peace, rose from the fields outside the town. The trees were already awakening and smiling a welcome, while above them the infinite, fathomless blue sky stretched into the distance, God knows whither. On reaching home, His Holiness drank some tea, then changed his clothes, lay down in his bed, and told the lay brother to close the shutters on the window. The bed was darkened. But what weariness, what pain in his legs and his back, a chill, heavy pain, what a noise in his ears. He had not slept for a long time, for a very long time, as it seemed to him now, and some trifling detail which haunted his brain as soon as his eyes were closed prevented him from sleeping. As on the day before, sounds reached him from the adjourning rooms through the walls, voices, the jingle of glasses and teaspoons. Marcia Timofeyevna was gaily telling Father Sosoy some story with quaint turns of speech, while the latter answered in a grumpy, ill-humored voice, Bother them! Not likely! What next? And the bishop again felt vexed, and then hurt that with other people his own mother behaved in a simple, ordinary way, while with him, her son, she was shy, spoke little, and did not say what she meant, and even, as he fancied, had during all the three days kept trying in his presence to find an excuse for standing up, because she was embarrassed at sitting before him. And his father? He too, probably, if he had been living, would not have been able to utter a word in the bishop's presence. Something fell down on the floor in the adjourning room, and was broken. Katya must have dropped a cup or a saucer, for Father Sosoy suddenly spat and said angrily, What a regular nuisance that child is! Lord, forgive my transgressions. One can't provide enough for her. Then all was quiet. The only sounds came from outside. And when the bishop opened his eyes, he saw Katya in his room, standing motionless, staring at him. Her red hair, as usual, stood up from under the comb like a halo. "'Is that you, Katya?' he asked. "'Who is it downstairs who keeps opening and shutting a door?' "'I don't hear it,' answered Katya, and she listened. "'There, someone has just passed by.' "'But that was a noise in your stomach, uncle.' He laughed and stroked her on the head. "'So you say Cousin Nikolishka cuts up dead people,' he said after a pause. "'Yes, he's studying.' "'And is he kind?' "'Oh, yes, he's kind.' but he drinks vodka awfully. And what was it your father died of? Papa was weak and very, very thin, and all at once his throat was bad. I was ill then, too, and brother Fedya. We all had bad throats. Papa died, uncle, and we got well. Her chin began quivering, and tears gleamed in her eyes and trickled down her cheeks. Your Holiness, she said in a shrill voice, by now weeping bitterly, Uncle, mother, and all of us are left very wretched. Give us a little money. Do be kind. Uncle Darling! He too was moved to tears, and for a long time was too much touched to speak. Then he stroked her on the head, patted her on the shoulder, and said, Very good, very good, my child. When the Holy Easter comes, we will talk it over. I will help you. I will help you. His mother came in quietly, timidly, and prayed before the icon. Noticing that he was not sleeping, she said, Won't you have a drop of soup? No, thank you, he answered. I am not hungry. You seem to be unwell now that I look at you. I should think so. You may well be ill. The whole day on your legs, the whole day. And my goodness, it makes one's heart ache even to look at you. Well, Easter's not far off. You will rest then, please God. Then we will have a talk, too. But now I'm not going to disturb you with my chatter. Come along, Katya. Let his holiness sleep a little. And he remembered how once, very long ago, when he was a boy, she had spoken exactly like that in the same jestingly respectful tone, with a church dignitary. Only from her extraordinary kind eyes and the timid, anxious glance she stole at him as she went out of the room, one could have guessed that this was his mother. 
He shut his eyes and seemed to sleep, but twice heard the clock strike and Father Sisoy coughing the other side of the wall. And once more his mother came in and looked timidly at him for a minute. Someone drove up to the steps, as he could hear, in a coach or in a chassis. Suddenly a knock. The door slammed. The lay brother came into the bedroom. "'Your Holiness,' he called. "'Well? The horses are here. It's time for the evening service. What o'clock is it? A quarter past seven. He dressed and drove to the cathedral. During all the twelve Gospels he had to stand in the middle of the church without moving, and the first Gospel, the longest and the most beautiful, he read himself. A mood of confidence and courage came over him. That first Gospel, now as the Son of Man glorified, he knew by heart, and as he read he raised his eyes from time to time, and saw on both sides a perfect sea of lights, and heard the sputter of candles. But as in past years he could not see the people, and it seemed as though these were all the same people as had been round him in those days, in his childhood and in his youth, that they would always be the same every year till such a time as God only knew. His father had been a deacon, his grandfather a priest, his great-grandfather a deacon, and his whole family, perhaps from the days when Christianity had been accepted in Russia, had belonged to the priesthood, and his love for the church services, for the priesthood, for the peal of bells, was deep in him, ineradicable, innate. In church, particularly when he took part in the service, he felt vigorous, of good cheer, happy. So it was now. Only when the eighth gospel had been read, he felt that his voice had grown weak, even his cough was inaudible. His head had begun to ache intensely, and he was troubled by a fear that he might fall down. And his legs were indeed quite numb, so by degrees he ceased to feel them, but could not understand how or on what he was standing, and why he did not fall. It was quarter to twelve when the service was over. When he reached home, the bishop undressed and went to bed at once without even saying his prayers. He could not speak, and felt that he could not have stood up. When he had covered his head with the quilt, he felt a sudden longing to be abroad, an insufferable longing. He felt that he would give his life not to see those pitiful cheap shutters, those low ceilings, not to smell that heavy monastery smell. If only there was one person to whom he could have talked, have opened his heart. For a long while he heard footsteps in the next room, and could not tell whose they were. At last the door opened, and Sisoy came in with a candle and the teacup in his hand. "'You're in bed already, Your Holiness,' he asked. "'Here I have come to rub you with spirit and vinegar. A thorough rubbing does a great deal of good. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way, that's the way. I've just been in our monastery. I don't like it. I'm going away from here tomorrow, Your Holiness. I don't want to stay longer. Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way.' Sisoy could not stay long in the same place, and he felt as though he had been a whole year in the Petrachevsky Monastery. Above all, listening to him it was difficult to understand where his home was, whether he cared for anyone or anything, whether he believed in God. He did not know himself why he was a monk, and indeed he did not think about it, and the time when he had become a monk had long passed out of his memory. It seemed as though he had been born a monk. I'm going away tomorrow. God be with them all. I should like to talk to you. I can't find the time, said the bishop softly with an effort. I don't know anything or anyone here. I'll stay till Sunday, if you like, so be it, but I don't want to stay longer. I am sick of them. I ought not to be a bishop, said the bishop softly. I ought to have been a village priest, a deacon, or simply a monk. All this oppresses me, oppresses me. What? Lord Jesus Christ, that's the way. Come, sleep well, your holiness. What's the good of talking? It's no use. Good night. The bishop did not sleep all night. At eight o'clock in the morning he began to have a hemorrhage from the bowels. The lay brother was alarmed, and ran first to the archimandrake, then to the monastery doctor, Ivan Andreich, who lived in the town. The doctor, a stout old man with a long gray beard, made a prolonged examination of the bishop, and kept shaking his head and frowning, then said, "'Do you know, Your Holiness, you have got typhoid?' After an hour or so of hemorrhage, the bishop looked much thinner, paler, and wasted. His face looked wrinkled, his eyes looked bigger, and he seemed older, shorter, and it seemed to him that he was thinner, weaker, more insignificant than anyone, that anything that had been had retreated far, far away and would never go on again or be repeated. How good, he thought. How good. His old mother came. Seeing his wrinkled face and his big eyes, she was frightened. She fell on her knees by the bed and began kissing his face, his shoulders, his hands. And to her, too, it seemed that he was thinner, weaker, and more insignificant than anyone, and now she forgot that he was a bishop and kissed him as though he were a child very near and very dear to her. Pavlusha, darling, she said, my own darling son, why are you like this? Pavlusha, answer me. Katya, pale and severe, stood beside her, unable to understand what was the matter with her uncle, 
why there was such a look of suffering on her grandmother's face, why she was saying such sad and touching things. By now he could not utter a word, he could understand nothing, and he imagined that he was a simple, ordinary man, that he was walking quickly, cheerfully through the fields, tapping with his stick, while above him was an open sky bathed in sunlight, and he was free now as a bird, and could go where he liked. Pavlusha, my darling son, answer me, the old woman was saying. What is it? My own. Do not disturb his holiness, Sosoy said angrily, walking about the room. Let him sleep. What's the use? It's no good. Three doctors arrived, consulted together, and went away again. The day was long, incredibly long, and then night came on and passed slowly, slowly, and towards the morning on Saturday, the lay brother went into the old mother who was lying on the sofa in the parlor and asked her to go into the bedroom. The bishop had just breathed his last. Next day was Easter Sunday. There were forty-two churches and six monasteries in the town. The sonorous, joyful clang of the bells hung over the town from the morning till the night unceasingly, setting the spring air a quiver. The birds were singing, and the sun was shining brightly. The big market square was noisy. Swings were going, barrel organs were playing, accordions were squeaking, drunk voices were shouting. After midday, people began driving up and down the principal street. In short, all was merriment and everything was satisfactory, just as it had been the year before, and as it will be in all likelihood next year. A month later a new suffragan bishop was appointed, and no one thought any more of Bishop Pyotr, and afterwards he was completely forgotten. And only the dead man's old mother, who is living today with her son-in-law the deacon in a remote little district town, when she goes out at night to bring her cow in, and meets other women at the pasture, begins talking of her children and her grandchildren, and says that she had a son a bishop, and this she says timidly, afraid that she might not be believed. And indeed, there are some who do not believe her. End of The Bishop by Anton Chekhov